So hey everybody, I'm Carrie Gross, uh, director of our Cancer Outcomes Copper Center, and uh, also a primary care doc. And with that background, it's a particular treat to welcome Dr. Philip Castle to join us today. Dr. Castle's work has been foundational in our understanding of the etiology and prevention of HPV-associated cancers and cancer prevention in general. Dr. Castle received his PhD in biophysics, actually, um, and master's in public health from Johns Hopkins. Uh, he was previously the uh, chief scientific officer at the American Society for Clinical Pathology. Uh, he's been a principal investigator for more than 15 years himself, initiating, conducting, and leading uh, several large NCI-sponsored molecular and clinical epi research studies, both in the US and abroad. His expertise is widely appreciated. Uh, he's contributed to virtually every major guideline regarding, regarding that cervical cancer uh, screening and prevention. And his work really has extended globally. Uh, his papers have been cited more than 40,000 times in the aggregate. And currently, Dr. Castle serves as the director of the Division of Cancer Prevention and Control at the NCI, where he oversees the conduct and support of research in cancer prevention early detection and screening. Uh, and now is a particularly relevant and timely setting for Dr. Castle to present to us. This is the 50th anniversary of the National Cancer Act. And as we reflect on the role of science in public health and society in general, and in the efforts against cancer in particular, the role of prevention as a means to decrease the burden of cancer is clearly a central one. So thank you for joining us today, Dr. Castle, and we look forward to your comments. Thank you so very much. It's a real honor to be here, uh, and it's a real honor to lead the NCI's Division of Cancer Prevention. Uh, today, I'm going to give you sort of a, a broad overview, um, recognizing, uh, as I learned, that many of my colleagues don't actually understand what the Division of Cancer Prevention does, how it's different from the other divisions, but also to... Um, highlight the work that we support and to engage you uh, hopefully in the future in, uh, in some of these uh, cancer prevention activities. So just uh, a few disclaimers to get started. Uh, opinions expressed are mine and should not be interpreted as representing official viewpoints of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, the National Institutes of Health, the National Cancer Institute, or the Division of Cancer Prevention. My comments are informal and should not be taken as a signal for funding priorities. I will speak in broad terms of what I think is important, where I would like to see the science of cancer prevention head towards in the future and my aspirations. Whether and when I or we can implement those priorities depends on many factors beyond my control. I wish that weren't the case, but it is in fact the case. Um, I wanted to highlight uh, the burden of cancer, and I know you all know this, but it's, it's, it's the starting point for this discussion uh, or any discussion about prevention, which sometimes I think um, sort of gets put into the second row here. But uh, uh, as you can see in the slide here on the, uh, in the left panel is the expenditures per billions of dollars annually for- We're not seeing your slides. We need to share. Let's see what's going on here, sorry. My apologies. Uh, can you see that now? Perfect, thank you. Okay, so uh, in the left panel is by cancer, the expenditures in billions of dollars annually. And then for the most common cancers or the most lethal cancers, you can see that it's not billions, but it's tens of billions of dollars. And in fact, the national costs of cancer were estimated to be 190 billion in 2015, and now 209 billion in 2020 an increase of 10% over that period of time. And that doesn't really even account for the uh, uh, hidden costs of cancer, which is appro approximated to be uh, 100 billion. And uh, as I'll show you in the next slide, we've made a lot of advances, certainly in the treatment of cancer, but we still have 1.5 million cancers and 0.6 million related deaths every year. And just to give you a perspective and, uh, on that, uh, as bad as COVID was and is, uh, 
uh, 0.6 million deaths um, is uh, almost twofold, not quite, but almost twofold more deaths um, than those than that caused by COVID. So uh, what, what's happened over the last uh, 45 years, you can see that arguably, and here are, this is CDC data rate per 100,000 of the population. We've really not made any uh, significant headway in the uh, incidence of cancer in males and females. There's a sort of a peak in males in the early 90s and that's come back down, but it's about the same level as it was in 1975. Um, and in females, it's gone up slightly. I mean, partly in due to an aging po population, to be sure. But you know, these are not the kinds of numbers we'd like to see. Uh, certainly, we've made some advances in the management of cancer and survival, uh, uh, particularly um, well in both in both sexes. Maybe perhaps more in males than females. Uh, but I would say also here that uh, even preventing uh, cancer-related death. Uh, it's a long life uh, or longer life of uh, significant morbidity um, and lower quality of life to live with cancer, as I know from my own family members. So uh, the mission of the Division of Cancer Prevention is uh, as follows. The NCI Division of Cancer Prevention leads, supports, and promotes rigorous, innovative research and training to reduce risks, burdens, consequences of cancer to improve the health of all people. And you'll understand this a little better as I go through and give you a, this at a glance uh, view of the Division of Cancer Prevention. Uh, just to highlight that I almost do nothing. This, uh, everything that you're gonna hear about it has to do with an amazing staff. Um, shown here, we have um, groups focused on method more methodologic approaches or exposures. And we also have organ specific um, areas of research as well. I will highlight some of these, but uh, that is not to say that there, I mean, we could talk for hours about what everybody's doing. Uh, I put up this translational continuum, and again, you'll see why here in a moment, to really sort of highlight this, uh, the stepwise development of interventions and, and, and therefore where we fit into that from basic science to translation to humans, translation to patients, translation to practice, and translation to the community. Showing um, this in terms of the divisions, and these are approximations, I wouldn't say that any one of, of these, uh, you know, nobody's limited uh, per se completely to this area, but I would say 90 to 95% of the work, uh, each of the division is sort of represented here in, in over, with an overlay of the translational continuum. We really focus on the um, on innovation to um, prevent cancer and to manage symptoms, as I will talk about later, um, and try to you know. So we identify and we do early validation work with the hopes that uh, successful strategies then get uh, uh, more or less handed off to the Division of Cancer Control and Population Sciences. So we really there really are two population science groups at the uh, NCI. We're a little bit sort of, I would say, the forgotten group or the, the, the other population science group. Um, I think people are generally more familiar with cancer control and population sciences because it tends to dovetail more, um, uh, more easily with the uh, cancer center and, the, and those renewals, particularly related to um, uh, uh, outreach. Uh, we're actually probably more aligned in terms of the work we do with the Division of Cancer Treatment and Diagnosis, uh, Albert. Uh, uh, we spend a lot more, we invest a lot more in treatment and diagnosis. We work closely with the Division of Cancer Biology, particularly on identifying pathways um, for cancer or carcinogenesis that can be then translated into prevention strategies. And then the intramural program with the Center of Cancer Research and Division of Cancer Epigenetics, which we're increasingly working closely with to try to get uh, their innovations into clinical practice and into public health. So, and you all know this, but it's always um, useful to sort of declare these things. Uh, cancer prevention is really, really hard. Um, uh, there's certainly an event bias or what I call an event bias. Success is the absence of events and therefore there are no champions. This is also referred to as the prevention paradox. 
our first mission is to keep healthy people healthy, uh, first do no harm. And, and I'd say this applies more to public health than even medicine. And I point out that you know when we do screening, people think of screening as a one-step process, but it's really a two-step process. The, the first step in screening is to tell healthy people they're healthy and they don't need to be screened again for whatever is an acceptable interval. And then among the positives, we, uh, we try to rule in who needs immediate care. But it's also important to remember uh, in the general population, most people at any one time will not be, um, uh, you know, will not get cancer or a particular cancer. So 49 out of 50 women would never get cervical cancer if we did nothing at all. We didn't screen them, we didn't vaccinate them, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's a high bar because of the rare events and the relatively small benefits, and there's very little tolerance for toxicity. Um, and then the final uh, barrier, if you will, is there's, uh, I think there's the perception that there's no money in prevention, and I, I would challenge that only to say that nobody wants to get cancer, and so there's a lot of people out there that don't want to get cancer. I mean, uh, you know, so I think that there's actually, you know, given the big denominator, there's a big opportunity for uh, industry to get involved in, in prevention. I think that what uh, scares them off is the, uh, the, the expense and difficulties of doing large trials to demonstrate um, uh, uh, efficacy and effectiveness and the very low tolerance for toxicity or adverse events. This is uh, highlights sort of the causes of cancer and where the op some of the opportunities are. I wouldn't say that they're, it's comprehensive. Um, this is from Scott Lipman in it at all. Uh, obviously, obesity uh, is, and tobacco are, are the main causes of cancer. Uh, tobacco, uh, you know, we, we even do some work in this area, particularly for anti-nicotine approaches. Uh, obesity, be, uh, I think, hangs over all of us in terms of how do we tackle this problem? How do we mitigate the effects of obesity? What is the you know, what is the causal relationship of obesity with cancer? Is it inflammation? What kind of inflammation, et cetera, et cetera. And then a variety of other causes. Uh, viruses are near and dear to my heart because of my work on human papillomavirus, which causes 5% of, um, uh, of cancers globally. So it's, um, uh, and HPV has been my training ground. Uh, uh, I started off as a lab scientist, but uh, moved into molecular epidemiology 20 years ago and continue to learn from st the study of HPV in many ways. So if we think about this causal model um, uh, where we go from normal to initiated to precursor states in invasive cancer, it really helps us sort of identify the roles of different groups, but also where, we, where the opportunities are for intervention. Now, precursor states, I mean, those are somewhat artificial uh, slices of the, of the pathway. And in the case of cervical cancer, it probably really aren't distinct states, just uh, clinical diagnoses that fall within this area somewhere between initiated and uh, precancer. So what can we do right now? Uh, obviously, and, and I will say highlight that uh, I recently published an op-ed in STAT to talk about uh, really these same strategies that are being used for COVID can be used for cancer prevention and that we really need a pandemic response for cancer prevention because of the annual burden of cancer. So avoidance is one strategy uh, or, or uh, primary prevention, if you will, uh, through tobacco prevention, HPV and HB, uh, HPV vaccination, treatment of H. pylori potentially, and then sec sort of secondary prevention through tobacco cessation, screening and diagnosis. And those tools, avoidance, vaccination, screening, and treatment are the very things that we're using now to uh, battle COVID. And really we need to highlight those and bring them back into the prevention discussion. Uh, we're working more and more in the area of interception of cancer. And I'll talk more about this in a moment, uh, right? And this is sort of moving us towards uh, what people refer to as precision cancer prevention. And I'll talk about that uh, a couple times through this and even propose a broader definition of uh, precision cancer prevention, but uh, obviously tamoxifen and its derivatives for breast cancer for those who are at high risk, NSAIDs for uh, colon cancer, immune modulators, drugs that target oncogenic drivers, 
and reactivators of tumor suppressor genes, for example. So uh, I'm gonna present this, uh, this chart or this picture for our three main programs here. It's what I call our preventive agent R&D pipeline. And the thing that I want to point out is that people don't always recognize these programs, particularly in DCP. We uh, gave a presentation for this new program called CAPIT, which I'll explain in a moment, to uh, the BSA members, the NCI uh, Board of Scientific Advisors. And one of the members didn't even know what prevent is. So let me, so I'm going to drag you through this because I want to engage you in the process of developing new prevention strategies. So uh, CAPIT is a new program. It's a uh, target and agent identification program for preventative agents. PREVENT is our preclinical development and validation program. And even you know, to the extent of uh, producing a GMP grade uh, drug for trials. CPC TNET is our early stage clinical trials network. And then CORE, which I'm sure everybody's heard of, is our, you know, our big uh, clinical trials network for primarily for phase three trials like TMIST. We had a Moonshot Consortium on, um, on novel adjuvants. ULACnet is uh, to look at uh, prevention of HPV related disease and HIV and people living with HIV in Latin America. We have funding opportunities for cancer prevention and control trials and a new one hitting the street on, um, in yellow here. Uh, cancer trials, planning and feasibility. It's kind of like a P20 funding opportunity. I, I can't remember what the, the, the mechanism is, but the, the basic idea is that these trials are very hard to do and to do de novo, and that if we spent some money investing them, we would uh, um, you know, get, the, uh, get the planning done and, the, and test the feasibility before they came for an R01 level funding. Uh, Precision Cancer Prevention Centers is, is, is the future, I hope, it's my dream and fantasy that it would, and it would dovetail with this R&D pipeline, but basically to engage um, centers uh, to kind of create their own pipeline that would um, um, move, uh, move from discovery to early translation to uh, our early human trials. And I emphasize here, as shown in below, that although these programs sit at the NCI, uh, they're open for investigator-initiated research to take advantage of these um, programs, and we encourage it. We want you to come forward with uh, new prevention strategies. And again, I want to emphasize that what DCP focuses is on innovation, new strategies that we haven't, that you know, are not, uh, you know, that need development and early validation. This just shows the um, CPCT net, uh, which is really um, this early phase clinical trials group that's across the country um, with a data monitoring and um, a, um, a board that's uh, data management and uh, that coordinates these activities, uh, optimizes clinical trial designs, develops surrogate and intermediate endpoint biomarkers, tests novel imaging technologies, and develop further insights into the mechanisms of cancer prevention by agents. And this is led by uh, Eva Zabo. Um, here's a, a couple of the approved trials that are already underway. One on NAFOLD, a, a, a HPV vaccine delayed booster trial, um, and a prostate um, uh, management trial as well. These are some of the uh, protocols that are under development, a wide range from you know, breast cancer to FAP, uh, metformin as a chemopreventative agent for lung cancer and high risk of these patients. Uh, I'm not gonna read through all these. Uh, you can have uh, these slides and kind of see the, the breadth and depth of the trials at the NCI. We're doing uh, a number of studies on topical tamoxifen to look at whether um, we can sort of change the benefits to harms ratio. And I'll, I'll come back to that point by delivering tamoxifen to the tissue at risk, and in this case, breast cancer, looking at some biomarkers in DCIS, breast density, measuring uh, inter-individual variation, 
and um, looking at serum and tissue concentrations of, of, of the drug being delivered uh, topically. Uh, ULAC-Net, which I mentioned before, is our uh, HPV prevention tr clinical trials network uh, in Latin America and Caribbean. And there are three consortium members working on a variety, uh, wide variety of interventions from some vaccination work to screening to precancer therapeutics in people living with HIV. So then that leads us into discussions of screening and early detection, which uh, we've done a lot. Uh, obviously, PLCO is one of the major US trials that was sponsored by the Division of Cancer Prevention. And here uh, above here in the yellow, I just want to uh, state that we're more and more thinking about what I call risk-informed screening. So using risk to decide who, who and when people need to be screened or to modify the management of the screen positives. And it also provides uh, a possible uh, or potential for intervention with targeted preventive agents. If we know the biology of what that risk is, then we could then uh, combine both a screening strategy with a preventive agent strategy. So this is our screening and early detection R&D pipeline. At the core of this is EDRN, which has been just renewed and is now tw 20 years in the making or in, in, its, in, its, um, in its life and it, it continues. Uh, I will present a few slides on that, but we have some um, related projects around uh, pancreas cancer, uh, PCDC, uh, liver cancer, TLCL. We have a liquid biopsy consortium and we have an imaging and biomarkers consortium. TBEL is a new um, program to help us differentiate between indolent and aggressive cancer. I'm sure many of you have heard of HTAN, uh, which is the Human Tumor Atlas Network. And uh, we built off of that a pilot study called the Pre-Cancer Atlas, which we're hoping to renew in the subsequent year or so. Uh, one of the big gaps that we need to fill is a screening and early detection network. Uh, not that NCOR doesn't do some of that, but we really need to engage the primary care providers to, to recruit average risk populations into our trials. And so that's why I show that in purple. Uh, we're developing a new lung cancer um, image library for um, uh, improved interpretation of those images. I mentioned ULACnet uh, several times. Uh, we're now uh, have on the street at Cascade, which is a, um, another consortium to look at best practices for uh, screening uh, women uh, living with HIV for cervical cancer, how, how best to screen them, manage them, and treat them. Last Mile is a project that I'm um, uh, co-leading on uh, getting self-collection and HPV testing approved for routine screening in the United States, and so forth. Uh, we're hoping to stand up some risk-informed screening for cancer trials, or what I call risk trials. and uh, we have a large trans-NCI liquid biopsy multi-cancer early detection program that uh, I've initiated and we'll be working on that, including what I hope is a large platform trial to look at some of these technologies going forward. Uh, this just gives you a sense of NCOR, uh, which is involved in uh, all of those uh, activities, the preventive agent development program, as well as the uh, screening and early detection. There are over a thousand clinical sites, 46 centers and affiliates, and more than 4,000 investigators. This is led by Warda McCaskill Stevens, and who's doing an incredible job of uh, herding the cats, if you will. Uh, I'm sure you've heard of uh, T-MIST, which is a randomized clinical trial to compare 2D versus 3D mammography. I'll show you some of the um, not results, but our, our recruitment and our recruitment uh, struggles during COVID. We've just launched Forte, which is to look at um, best, best management of you know, low, fairly low risk um, uh, populations who have one to two non-advanced uh, polyps. And then uh, a management trial for pancreatic cysts. You can see here that T-MIST was uh, as, as was many of our activities uh, adversely affected by the COVID pandemic. 
um, shown here, um, highlighted down here. You can see that the uh, enrollment almost went to zero during the height of the pandemic. It's now come back and exceeded um, the monthly recruitment levels. So we're very excited about that. And uh, over time, we'll start getting some readouts from the trial itself on 3D versus 2D mammography. Um, this just highlights the Cascade, which is a global multi-center cooperative agreement clinical trials network to optimize the uh, cervical cancer screening and treatment cascade for women living with HIV, looking at all these issues in the care, con, um, continuum care of care, from screening uptake to management of positives, pre-cancer treatment, and so forth. Although this will be, uh, will have sites in the United States, we will also include sites in low and middle income countries. Uh, last mile, as I mentioned, is really going to, we hope, um, bring uh, HPV testing of self-collected samples online in the United States. And we're working very closely with the FDA on this. And just to say that I've spent uh, 15 years working on this topic, more than 15 years. Uh, I know I look young, but it, it has been more than 15 years working on this particular one. Um, that uh, the idea that we can democratize screening by bringing uh, screening to the homes or to uh, convenient areas uh, for uh, participation in screening, I think is going to be a game changer, uh, not just nationally, but globally. Although most countries don't, necessarily take FDA approval directly in consideration. It is a big deal to have an FDA approval for um, a particular intervention. So we're very excited about this initiative, uh, which we're hoping to launch in the next year or so. And, and the other thing to say about this is from the meta-analyses that I've participated in um, and others, we know that women prefer this. I mean, it's kind of a no-brainer. and using a PCR-based HPV test, there's really little or no um, decrement in clinical performance. So um, this is a big deal if we can get it underway, and it's a big deal uh, in the global battle against uh, uh, cervical cancer. Uh, EDRN uh, was established in 2000 um, to support investigator-initiated research for the development and validation of biomarkers, foster interaction cooperation between academic, clinical, industrial partners or leaders, furnish and apply standardized biomarker validation criteria and quality assurance, and facilitate regulatory processes to bring biomarkers rapidly into clinical use. This is really our core biomarker for you know, screening and for prevention and early detection. And Sudhir um, has done an amazing job on this program. Um, this just gives you a sense of the, of, the, of the different components of this. There are four main research groups shown here on the left. There's a steering and executive com uh, committees that oversee and review the program on a regular basis. Uh, we have a consulting team and then EDRN because of its breadth and depth has really started to um, you know, permeate all uh, um, areas related to um, early detection, biomarkers related to early detection and prevention. Uh, projects, uh, collaborations with Japan, India, France. Um, we've gotten co-funding from a variety of organizations. As I mentioned, there are tangential uh, collaborative groups that um, expand on particular areas of EDRN. Uh, many associate members, federal partners, and we engage directly with pharma and bi uh, biotech industry. These are just some of the tests and I won't go over them. Uh, obviously, the, perhaps the one that you're uh, hearing a lot about is Cancer Seek, which is a multi-cancer early detection, uh, which was supported uh, by the EDRN, but there are many more. And with this next round of renewal, we're really hoping to push more things to FDA approval and into clinical practice. And that's really gonna be our metric going forward is how much of this gets into routine care. Uh, I sort of alluded to this before, but the idea that we could bring these two pipelines together, um, one is biomarker uh, discovery, um, as, well as, and, uh, as well as bringing a preventive agent uh, into the mix and so that you could detect and mitigate cancer risk. 
But um, as I will talk about later, I really want to expand what we call precision cancer prevention. Um, and I will talk about that a little bit later. We also do symptom management, which seems odd, but uh, uh, that's the way it is. And actually, I'm very excited about this. I think there's tremendous opportunity to improve symptom management and supportive care. What's really important about this to me is that the prevention and treatment of symptoms um, from cancer and cancer treatment really has a profound effect on the quality of life of patients, but also their ability to survive uh, the cancer and cancer treatment. If we can manage symptoms better, as you well know, many of you are oncologists, uh, the clinical performance remains high. Um, and so patients really not only get their first line of treatment, they get their second and third line treatment and even treatments that haven't been invented today, but will be tomorrow. So we have a very broad portfolio, uh, big and broad portfolio in, in, uh, in symptom management shown here. Uh, those are the number in the upper left-hand panel is the number of grants per, uh, per year. Uh, we're really the only group at the NCI that focuses on pain management. And much of these activities happen within our clinical trials network uh, now called NCOR, it used to be CCOP. So this is again, the pipeline and I use this as a, as a sort of a platform for thinking about where we wanna go. We have a lot of um, you know, activities in our clinical trials, but what's really lacking is an investment in the biology and genetics of symptoms and symptom management. What we'll call here is precision symptom management or symptom science. Uh, and so we really, I'm hoping in the next couple of years to, make, to get some NCI investment in this area. There's no reason for trial and error related to symptom management any more than there is for uh, cancer treatment itself. Uh, we've been doing a lot on um, defining patient reported outcomes and standardizing them, which is important for uh, as sort of a base for uh, doing anything to improve symptom management. If we can't measure the outcomes, then there's not much for us to do um, and not much, we can't show anything. So the, this moonshot, the tolerability consortium focused on analyzing and interpreting clinician and patient adverse event data to better understand tolerability, uh, doing so by creating a consortium to share analytic approaches. Um, and so let me conclude a, a, with a few slides here and then we'll open up for questions. Um, these are sort of my informal um, unofficial priorities, really understanding biologic risk and using that to guide um, uh, what we do uh, for patients but also population risk to decide who gets screened and how, how to screen, how to, uh, how screen positives are managed and how to harmonize care. What I call equal risk, equal care for equal risk, which is an idea that we had promulgated uh, over 15 years ago in the cervix world, as we saw that there were the, all these new tools coming and there was gonna be a great deal of heterogeneity in the population risk to the vaccination. We really needed a organizing principle here. Obesity, as I mentioned before, um, causes so much of the burden of cancer and we really don't understand it. Uh, if we did, we could mitigate its effects. Obviously change in lifestyle and behavior would be ideal, but I think it's a real challenge to get uh, people to change their, their lifestyle and behavior over a course of decades. And so I'm not saying that we shouldn't invest in that, but I'm saying Complementary to that, we really should understand the pathways and how obesity contributes to carcinogenesis so that we can uh, um, combine that with uh, changes in lifestyle and behavior. I think I've said enough about precision symptom uh, prevention and management, but I, you know, just to emphasize that I, I think we need to move away from the trial and error that often occurs in clinical management. That's not a criticism of the cl clinicians at all. It's just that we haven't we haven't really taken this um, as seriously as we should in terms of bringing the same kind of focus on precision medicine to this area as we have in other areas. Health disparities, I, I think there's a lot of opportunity for innovation. Uh, I mentioned self-collection, developing point of care testing like for HCV. Um, you know, bring the, bringing the test to the people or bringing the um, intervention to the people rather than just relying on them to come 
to the clinic, we know that persistent rurality is a major risk factor for cancer. And then we're being bombarded with new technologies, AI, multi-cancer, early detection, synthetic biomarkers, et cetera, et cetera. We really, the NCI plays a pivotal role in sort of getting out in front and figuring out what's good and what's not without bias, without an agenda. And, and I think we need to do that more and more as these new technologies roll out faster and faster. Um, I, I want to pose something that might be a little bit controversial, which is a, a broader de definition of precision cancer prevention to achieve equitable care for all. And the core principles here are the benefits to harms ratio and understanding all causes of differences, not just biological, which informs how we can be more precise. So what we've typically figured on is the what, which is based on an understanding of carcinogenic processes, target early changes via screening or interception. Uh, but I wanna add the who uh, into this, which isn't always integrated into this, which is who's at risk and how much risk. And that really tells us um, not just what age, but what kind of screen um, to use or what kind of intervention to use and what's the follow-up uh, care. Where uh, alternative delivery st strategies, like I mentioned, home-based sample coll collection or testing, app-based interventions, and so forth. And then how benefits and harms can be manipulated by alternative routes of administration, like topical tamoxifen, uh, maintaining effective doses more consistently through sustained release to reduce toxicity and perhaps even improve, improve um, uh, the benefits, the cancer prevention benefits, and even strategies for immunization. I mean, we, we often focus on active immunization, but sometimes you can't develop a good response or a sufficient response. So maybe we have to make antibodies like anti-nicotine antibodies, which we are uh, supporting right now, um, to give people the immune spot, uh, immune response that they need. I think this is my final slide, which is just a call out for our Cancer Prevention Fellowship Program from which I spawned, so how bad can it be? Um, this is a multidisciplinary, diverse, and highly competitive postdoctoral training program that provides flexibility for fellows to generate and pursue original scientific ideas and structure to develop competencies to support their future as leaders in the field. Uh, what I'm very proud of is uh, we've got now cancer prevention fellows from Costa Rica, and we are working towards the idea of having an ongoing international training component to this cancer prevention fellowship. And then the cancer prevention fellowship program has alumni across the, uh, all across the country and the world. Um, you know, it's been around for 35 years now. Um, and uh, fellows are uh, at major cancer centers and leadership positions, uh, government agencies, research firms, foundations, and policy uh, organizations. And the website for the Cancer Prevention Fellowship Program is shown there at the bottom. So with that, I'll say thank you, and I'll take any questions uh, um, from the audience. And thanks again for the invitation to the Yale Cancer Center. Thank you very much, Dr. Bassett, for a great talk and kind of a whirlwind overview of uh, um, uh, what's been going on and an exciting uh, preview of, of next steps. Just thinking, so I've asked people to send questions via the chat, but um, while we're waiting for some other questions, I, I have one just to get the ball rolling. So in your position, the uh, decisions need to be made with regard to prioritization of you know, large scale efforts. What, what, what are the overarching strategies of the center? Beneath that, there are um, more tactical decisions, which, which grants to fund or which uh, P, P grants or program project grants or, or whatnot. So my question to you is, how do you track success? Uh, how, do you, how do you know five years from now whether you made the right decisions or not? Like if you imagine an alternate universe where you could have been focused, the, you know, the center could have been focusing on completely different things or completely different strategies, they could have different outcomes. So I, I, I'm just curious how you think about how, you know, how to evaluate the progress of, of the center's making, it's both like what's the time horizon and what are the metrics for evaluating success? 
Boy, you've touched, I mean, you went right to the heart of it, right? Not just from a programmatic standpoint, but from a prevention standpoint, because it often takes more than five years to show that any of this stuff works. And I think that is sort of one of the major barriers for researchers getting into the prevention field, because it's just hard, you know, even, you know, and, and the more successful you are, like for screening, even harder it is to do a prevention trial, right? Because then you start ex uh, extending screening intervals to the point where you can't even study it within an R01. So, I mean, some of these things, uh, you know, that's why we have to do things more sort of directed by the NCI as a clinical trial rather than just relying on an R01. I know everybody wants to put all the money into the R01, but my calling is to come up with the best prevention strategies. And sometimes it just doesn't fit within the, the framework of an R01. There's no way that I can know in advance whether my guesses are good. And as you pointed out, I have to make guess, I have to make edu informed, I hope informed guesses about where we should put our energies. Um, I think what I've been trying to impress upon my staff and through my staff to the uh, extramural investigators, we want to ground this in the best science possible, uh, knowing that even that may not be good enough. And, and one of the challenges, and we, were, we have an ongoing workshop the last couple of days, is that um, we rely particularly for preventive agents on mouse models. But there's a lot of issues with mouse models. You know, do, how well does it recapitulate um, human biology? How much can we rely on that? Because what happens, of course, is then we go to you know, human trials based on those results. Even the phase one, phase two trials are expensive. They take a long time and, and don't have an efficacy readout. So let's say the toxicity is okay. Then you go into a five or seven or 10 year trial. And only at the end there do you figure out, oh my God, this doesn't work. We've just spent a hundred million dollars for something that's not going to help anybody. So it really is a challenge and I don't have a good answer. I, I would say that one of the ways forward is we really have to think hard about surrogate endpoints for cancer risk or cancer mortality. So screening trials are particularly um, challenging because right now the only thing that we, I think everybody can completely agree upon is if it reduces cancer mortality, it works. But stage shift doesn't necessarily translate, at least uh, right now, into benefit, and you can see the UK ovarian cancer screening trial is an example of that. Although I, I believe eventually stage shift should translate into mortality benefit, but until we've shown, you know, until that becomes a reliable surrogate endpoint, it doesn't, it's hard to then recommend something for general use. So our, you know, one of our challenges, whether it's, and I've been challenging the nutritional science group within our that we can't go into this black box of like, eat this, we, you know, we can get people to do this. And then we're gonna go into a clinical trial to show you know, reduction of cancer incidence, which will take years and years and years and years to do. We need intermediate endpoints that we can rely on that at least push us in the right direction, right? That screen out the, you know, uh, some of the things that aren't gonna work. Um, I do think that we have, because of the time and the expense, we're going to have to be more specific than sensitive. We can't chase after everything. So we have to place a sort of higher bar uh, in this um, development process and, um, and recognizing that we're going to miss some opportunities. Uh, but the, the opportunity costs of chasing after our tail are really significant and, and problematic. So there is no good solution. If you have one, please tell me because, you know, we talk about this all the time. It's just hard. It's hard to do prevention. And yet everybody knows, I mean, even the most hardcore oncologists would tell you, you know, you know, prevention is our first line of defense. Uh, and if, you know, and I always say this to my audience I say, walk down the street after COVID when it's safe and ask the first hundred people you walk into and say, would you like your cancer prevented or treated? You know, I'll take that bet with odds that every one of them is going to say, of course, I want my cancer prevented. So we all know it's important. We all want it to go forward, but there are some real challenges to it. And, you know, as I mentioned before, the other challenge, of course, is 
very low tolerance for toxicity. Um, if you're primarily dealing with average risk people who are on that day, most of them healthy, you can't, you know, you just can't do bad things to them, uh, understandably. So, you know, the, the cervix world is, is sort of the outlier in a way. It's, it was the low hanging, hanging fruit. You have, you know, you have relatively easy accessible tissue. You have a single causal agent and you, it takes 20 to 25 years to go from infection on average to cancer. I mean, that, you know, if, we, if I wanna be honest about that, that one was supposed to be successful and, and the other ones are much harder. So. Thank you. And no, I don't have a clear answer. That's why I asked you. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I, I, believe me, if I had an answer, I would share it with you, but I, I don't, we struggle with this. I think. The best thing we can do is ground this in better science, right? Understanding the molecular. I mean, people wanted the magic bullet, right? If you eat this, this is going to work. And I'm not saying that that won't work, but let's look at nutrition for a second here. And, and I apologize to any nutritional epidemiologists or scientists. And, um, but the challenges of going from eating something into a clinical trial are profound, right? So likely it's going to be a low penetrance um, Thing, even if, if you can measure it and the, the ability to show it both at the lab level and the, you know, if you go through the Hill criteria and you say, we've got to get to a certain number of those before we're going to go into a clinical trial. And then in most cases, you're really talking about a, a, a low penetrance or weak penetrance of a, or a weak effect, right? So then you're talking about a huge trial. You're, you know, you're really rolling the dice on, you know, 50 to $100 million trial to get the kinds of endpoints. And that's and we've failed. We've had a number of failures. And, and, you know, the other one that people have been chasing after is metformin and we're, or, um, and, and that's really turning out to not, not be relevant in the prevention space, or it's so, it's such a weak effect that we can't measure it. Right. So that's the other problem. It might have a, a modifying effect, but we can't measure it. And therefore we can't recommend it. And more importantly, the U S preventive services task force can't recommend it. So, uh, and, and, you know, that, so, I mean, part of it is we want something that's so cheap that you can get it off the shelf or, or you can go to the grocery store and eat it. That has not panned out and, and, and there can be a lot of reasons for that. And it doesn't mean that it doesn't work, but it's hard to show it and it's hard to invest that money in showing it. So a follow-up question, thinking about the challenge of small effect sizes or AKA large sample sizes that are needed and great expense. Just thinking about the experience during COVID, the, the UK um, kind of ran circles around us uh, as a nation with regard to the facility that conducted these large trials. So that they had the recovery trial, which um, actually enrolled 10% of all patients across the country who are hospitalized in the UK were enrolled in this large, you know, this large centrally coordinated trial randomization. It just generated a great deal of of prompt, really informative information. And kind of people have subsequently been saying, well, what can we learn post-COVID from the recovery trial and the more centralized approach? So, you know, building on, I know you mentioned this, uh, the screening and early detection network. Um, what are the strategies for creating this large, I know G Corvette, I know there are other things out there, for large systems where we could be running multiple trials at the same time and have like a single infrastructure that's really, really big. Well, we've, I mean, to some extent we've done that with NCOR, but the, that tends to be, you know, at cancer centers and, you know, oncology services. I mean, so some of the things that we're doing like TMIST where you have to have radiology anyway, that, that kind of works in that network. But we have other networks that are in place that could be leveraged. It's a matter of coordinating them and being willing. Now, some people would say Kaiser's, although my experience, and I've worked with Kaiser Permanente in Northern California for, 15 plus years, they're not really set up to do clinical trials, but one could imagine some combination of uh, FQHCs and other providers, but starting to link them. Now, between you and me, and I'll deny this uh, if, if anybody quotes me, if you start doing that, you start building a, a public health infrastructure, which I think COVID revealed we didn't have in the United States. So, it is easier to do some of the stuff in Europe because they have organized programs. They have organized healthcare, they have organized screening. 
We do not, but I think we can start pushing along those ways. And it would be hope, my hope, you know, probably long after I'm gone, but that by doing these kinds of activities where you show networks can work together, that you start to build the, an informal um, organized screening program. We know there's a lot of data now to suggest that organized screening really makes a difference in terms of the effectiveness of the program. Uh, and I've had the privilege uh, and just was reviewing another paper from them of working with Norway for the last eight or nine years. And that's been a real pleasure to like what they can do uh, to, you know, and how they can make switches, um, how they can really get high coverage and, and identify people for whom the system is not working, right? And, and come up with alternative strategies. So we know that screening, like even for cervix, we know that 20, 10 to 20% of people don't get their routine screening or don't get screened at all. And that's where half of the cervical cancers occur. So if we can bridge that gap, then we're making progress. So, I mean, that's not the typical innovation that the division has focused on in the past, but I'm a population scientist who's worked on some of this stuff. So that's why I've sort of been thinking about my own de definition of precision cancer prevention and trying to expand that to say, it isn't just um, what we do, like targeting carcinogenic pathways, it's also how we do it and where we do it and for whom do we do it. So. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Let me pause. I do. I don't want to turn this into a fireside chat. Although it'd be nice. But I want to make sure I have. Oh, okay. I like fireside chats. I'm happy to have that, <laughs> even separately. I can come back. Um, well, I've had one other. No other questions from the groups. One other quick question is: um, This occurs to me that what are your thoughts about some form of a whole of government approach, an intersectoral approach, where we're talking about, you know, things like. You know, this is political, so I won't go too far down which avenue, but you know, we subsidize corn. So we, our government on the one hand is doing things that's actually increasing the obesity in our country. So just thinking, are, are there avenues towards um, collaborating across sectors within the government to you know think about changes at the policy level to um, I don't know, change the diet or, or um, you know, kind of incorporate to lead to evidence-based policy change or there's some form of demonstration pro projects that could relate to things such as for change in diet, or, you know, population efforts to, to address obesity or and see how that might affect cancer. Right. Well, it, that's an interesting question. Of course, you know, one of the things that I think about is, you know, this crossover of obesity and smoking. I mean, smoking suppresses diet. So is there going to be a point of crossover where where obesity becomes more important than smoking. Um, but uh, I'm not suggesting that anybody should start smoking to prevent uh, obesity, by the way. Um, if you think about the successes, uh, the public health successes in the United States, they've really come, they've been driven sort of from the ground up, right? So if you look at smoking, you know, it was lawsuits and you know, demands from the public to say, this is, this is, you know, we have to do something. Uh, even the, you know, one of the most successful public health campaigns has been HIV, right? And, and, and that's because people demanded it. They got up on their soapbox and they said, you have to do something. And so I think, you know, one of my jobs although you know, I'm not a implementation and dissemination person, that's in DCCPS, but I've done that work for my entire career. And we can speak about the oddity of me leading the Division of Cancer Prevention if you want. But the, I, I do think that we have to educate the public on the possibility of prevention, which is why I wrote that op-ed to say, if we can do this for COVID, we should be doing it for cancer prevention, that it's our first line of defense. Not that we're going to prevent all cancer. I, you know, I have no illusions of that. But I think there's a lot more, and you have to make the investment. We invest three times, just in the government, we invest three times more into treatment than we do prevention, uh, let alone pharma. I mean, pharma, it's got to be 20 to 1 uh, or more. So uh, I think it's, it's getting, getting voices to say, you know, we need to make these investments in prevention. We need to understand obesity. We need to also have policies about, you know, um, 
what we make available for foods and, and tax, you know, one of the most effective strategies is taxation. Um, so, you know, I'm 10 years ago, I was sitting at the uh, UN meeting on, NC, you know, global NCDs. And, you know, there was a lot of talk about the policy end and taxation and, you know, making sugary foods less available, right? If you want, because I think, this is my opinion, and I, I don't mean to be offensive in any way, but we are hardwired to eat. It is primal. And I don't think we evolved to have unlimited access to food, but we do now. And so I know I have like no resistance. And the fact that I'm sitting in home and I'm you know literally 20 feet away from my refrigerator is trouble. Like if I'm not around it, I'm much better off. I just am. But if, and in fact, when I was at Einstein, I wouldn't take anything to work because I knew that, you know, I, it just, if it's not there, I don't eat it. But if it's there, I will eat it. I have like no resistance. And I don't think I'm unusual that way. I think I'm fairly represented despite my knowledge base, right? So uh, I think, you know, our challenge is understanding fundamentally what we're hardwired to do. I mean, smoking is a little different because it's not a survival thing, but once you're addicted, you're addicted, right? You're wiring you know, you've, you've done, you've played, you know, it's haywire, you know, you've messed with your, you know, with the, the program, but food is fundamental. We eat we, to survive. So we evolved that capacity over, you know, millennia to, you know, uh, and when we evolved it, we evolved it when we had to go out and hunt and gather, right? So there was a lot of exercise and the marginal difference between our caloric expenditure and our intake kept things in the right place. But now I can go down to the store and get, you know, uh, or to a restaurant and get a thousand, thousand calorie lunch easily when we're not even supposed to exceed 2000, right? So one meal and I've, you know, it's all haywire. So I, you see what I'm saying? I think it really for the BCD thing, I, I mean, I do think that the NCI's responsibility to do research, to understand and come up with strategies to mitigate it, recognizing that there are, we may not get these other problems solved, but I think this is gonna be a policy, ultimately, just like smoking. Oh, thank you. Oh, and um, actually, uh, now I feel guilty about, I'm about to walk out and buy a thousand calorie lunch right now, thank you. <laughs> but uh, uh, no, thank you for so much for joining us and for uh, your thoughts. We're, we're, I, I hope it was provocative. I hope people got out of, a lot out of it. It wasn't your typical uh, scientific presentation, but I really wanted to get out and sort of encourage people to come to the Division of Cancer Prevention with their new prevention ideas. We really need everybody um, in the boat you know, coming up with new strategies to prevent cancer. Um, I think the public deserves it. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. All right. Good luck, everyone.